The story of organized crime in Ireland today is the story of narcotics. I think you'll have to view drugs as being the mainstay of organized crime. Most of the upper echelons operate on a very sophisticated basis. I would describe the modern day criminal as unpredictable, paranoid, and he will go to any length to protect his business. The gangsters who jostle for financial gain in the volatile world of drug trafficking are fighting for an empire that was built up in the 1980s through the heroin trade. When the big profits started seeping through from Europe, they couldn't believe just how much money you could make for very little risk. Some of it, frankly, once you got into the millions, was quite unbelievable. And then the killing started. There was a man shot at Weaver Street, Fran Rogers. I was there. Gunman walked up to him, shot him in the legs as he tried to run, and then walked up and shot him in the head. Ireland's one billion euro drug business is controlled by a complex network of criminal gangs. Organised crime bosses aren't guys with horns and tails who live in run-down estates with their own passwords and language and code of conduct, you know, they're among us. Their market spreads from the deprived inner cities to small towns, villages and leafy suburbs across the country. Territory is closely guarded with the assassin's bullet. Welcome to Badfellas. In April 2010, Spanish police swooped on what they described as one of the biggest organized crime syndicates in Europe, with tentacles spread throughout the world and an estimated balance sheet of 1 billion euro from the sale of narcotics. Money laundering, drug trafficking and gun crime. The business of the international crime network targeted in today's operation. Operation Shovel involved law enforcement agencies on both sides of the Atlantic. The target was neither the Mafia nor a Colombian drug cartel. This huge international conspiracy was an Irish affair. In all, 17 arrests were made in Spain. Nine of those people are Irish. At its head was Dubliner Christy Kenahan, a.k.a. the Dapper Don. A colourful underworld sophisticate with university degrees and a fluency in at least three foreign languages. It's primarily an Irish organised crime group operating on the continent, but obviously with far-reaching effect. A lot of these more sophisticated drug dealers, drug barns, uh, are removed from actual selling, actual hands-on. They're not even located in this country. And here was a guy who started off as a small-time drug pusher, ending up with a, a criminal empire that stretched across three or four different continents. He's been able to launder his money globally by a series of accountants and financiers and he's been able to invest into companies like waste renewals and recyclable energies and things like this. So his network uh, was quite vast and complex. At 53 years of age, Christy Kenahan had come a long way from his days as a heroin addict and a small time pusher on the streets of the inner city where he grew up. To tell the story of how the lethal business of narcotics contaminated every community in the country, we have to go back to the Dublin of the 1980s. The Liberties, it was a great mix of uh, working class and middle class people in that time. My own experience, we had three young kids at the time. We lived up in uh, South Earl Street. The thing probably worried most people would be, you know, if you could get a decent job, decent education. Maybe meet someone, marry someone, get a decent place. There were a lot of happy memories of life in the Liberties prior to the, the onslaught of the heroin. When I grew up in Fingers, was a great sense of community. Yeah, you could walk into other people's houses. Doors are left unlocked, believe it or not. Today, Brian and Teresa Whelan and their three children are prisoners of unemployment. You always felt that no matter what trouble came, there was always a door you could knock on and there would always be somebody to help you. From the time that I joined the Garda Síochána in the early 60s and saw the improvement that occurred in relation to housing to an extent, the old tenements were gone, the people were rehoused, a lot of people made progress in life and then 
the heroin came. Oh, you yeah. yeah. Open it. It's not me, yeah. The introduction of heroin to the city was a catastrophe for those who lived in the poorer areas. In the 60s and 70s, drug abuse was virtually unheard of in Ireland. Some students experimented with pot. Some even inhaled. There was a handful of opium addicts attending clinics, but cocaine and heroin were not thought to be substances that the Irish people would acquire a taste for. In the beginning, the drugs problem was harmless enough in Ireland. The very first Garda drugs investigators uh, were positioned within Special Branch. And that was because drugs were deemed to be something foreign, nothing to do with Ireland or Irish society, and uh, therefore Special Branch, with all their specialties, should deal with them. Drugs were tacked onto the special branch because they dealt with spies and, uh, you know, aliens. Uh, so you may as well throw drugs in there. The fact that the Garda Band had a superintendent running it, and the press office had a superintendent running it, and the drug squad had a sergeant running it, said an awful lot, you know. That cosy arrangement wouldn't survive the dramatic mood swing of the 1980s. The 70s witnessed the genesis of organized crime in Ireland. Republican paramilitaries had brought back the gun. Armed robbery was the order of the day, and career criminals had jumped on the bandwagon. There was a man with a gun coming out of the bank. Two men came out of the bank down with trolleys, and they just pulled into the farm. But by the end of the decade, the cops were giving the robbers a run for their money. After a Garda chase, about three shots were fired at or above these two Garda officers. Most, if not all, of the money had been dropped along the way. By then, armed robbery had become quite a dangerous occupation. I mean, I knew a couple of people in that line of work quite well, and one of them told me uh, that you had three minutes from the time you got into a bank to the time you got out again before you could expect the emergency response from the guards. So that was becoming quite a dangerous occupation. If you look at the crime statistics for armed robberies in the late 70s and early 80s, you'll see a dramatic fall off. In July 1978, Ireland's leading crime family, the Duns, pulled off a robbery that would revolutionize organized crime in Ireland. A raid on the antigen factory at Ross Gray County Tipperary had netted a haul of the painkiller Palfium. Later, when the brothers, led by Larry, realized the black market value of drugs, there was no going back. Narcotics was easy money, and it was big money. They met a man who I can't name, called him the Prince. He was a very accomplished criminal who uh, cut his teeth in England, had west of Ireland roots, came back to Ireland, very, you know, polished operator. He met the Dons and he realized that there was a marriage of convenience possible here and he basically introduced them to contacts he had in the middle east turks initially uh, and they began to smuggle heroin and cannabis into ireland Don's very quickly realized this was much safer and more profitable than trying to rob banks the heroin problem commenced in the autumn of 1979. It spread out into other gangs and other groups and other families later on, but that, insofar as I am aware, uh, and I was centrally involved in the drug investigations through all of that period, that is where it started. When the Prince met the Dons, you know, the rules changed. Drugs were suddenly part of the life of, of Dublin, and they've never gone away since. the very heart of the city would become ground zero. It was here, in Dublin's most impoverished streets, that Larry Dunn and his brothers would cultivate the market. RTE reporter Brendan O'Brien was one of the first journalists to bring the heroin story to the notice of the Irish public. Just go up to a flat ray, and you can get it straight away like that, and then you just go out and use it. And do you think there are many people around on it? So not, yeah. The Duns themselves, they were of the people. That was a great strength from their point of view. It was fairly standard practice to 
give out drugs free or near to free. And before you know it, they'll be willing to pay for it. And then before you know it, they're addicted. And they're not taking it for pleasure anymore. They're taking it because our system has to have it. It was like a prairie fire. It just swept through the area. And I think the reason why it happened very quick was because the people knew and to some extent trusted the dealers because there was a culture there of acceptance of criminality. And once the main criminals turned into drug dealing, there wasn't any question other than this must be okay because they're, they're saying it's okay. And that was the roots of the problem. For years, Father Paul Lavelle was curate to a large inner city parish. Then heroin arrived. If you take New York, I think it's fair to say that proportionately we have as big a problem in certain areas as they would have in any area like Harlem in New York. Now, these kids were pumping huge amounts of this to make them cope with the pain of life. No job, no school, and they work for a while. They are pleasurable, that's why they take them. At first, it is probably true to say that people were not aware, including the Duns, of the devastating effect of heroin on ordinary people. But what they quickly came to realize was that it was extremely addictive. And being extremely addictive, people had to continue to buy it. The Duns found that this was highly lucrative and highly successful. Larry Dunn and his clan nurtured that craving. The Dunn's hawked their heroin across the city and found they were pushing on open doors. It did come to my door, yes. Uh, my daughter, I think, uh, I think it's, it should be said she was an addict. It isn't as if it's a sickness, like cancer or something. Everyone rallies around. When somebody is feeding a heroin habit, the only thing they have to think about for the rest of the day is where are they going to get fixed up. The people who love addicts before they become addicts, they're the people who really, really pay the price. The fathers, the mothers, the brothers, the sisters. I mean, when you take it, the son or daughter that you've, you've reared, so that's coming into their own home. The mother's purse has to be hid. When everything that's valuable in the home has to be locked down. An electrical that can be sold for a quick buck just disappears. You have a family in chaos. Heroin demoralized families all across the city of Dublin. The police were overwhelmed by the crime wave that the drug unleashed on neighborhoods. The police in my area just have washed their hands of the community. They've contained the drug problem within the come and they're happy to keep it there as long as it stays there. I think we all had a sense at that time that the police were just putting in their time, drawing away so they didn't give a shit about working class areas like the way we lived in. Gilda Shea Corona, I would feel, never thought it was going to reach the epidemic proportion that it did. It happened very quickly, and it happened quietly. At the time, we didn't see it coming. The basic problem was that a lot of the guards were from the country. They weren't used to an urban situation, the dynamics of a city, and they certainly weren't used to the type of problem that was emerging on the ground, which was the area being flooded by heroin. Few in Dáil Éireann appreciated the significance of the heroin crisis. The Duns had changed the criminal landscape forever. In time, drug gangs would not only undermine whole communities, but challenge Irish democracy itself. It's not just Larry Dunn. There are other people just as big as Larry Dunn. Tony Gregory raised it in the Dáil on a number of occasions. But the political view around Dublin was that while it was a serious issue in the North Inner City, it was confined to the North Inner City. And I actually had discussions with Bertie Hearn because I thought Tony Gregory was a bit alarmist. And he confirmed everything that Tony had said. It is, I think, very fair to surmise that over this period that no political party had really understood the level of sophistication that was behind the heroin epidemic. I think there was a sense of panic at how they were going to start dealing with this. There was no real plan by the Eastern Health Board. I was on the board. There was no plan in the corporation. I was on the corporation. There was no real plan um, at government level either. At government level, I think it's probably fair to say, cruel as it may sound, that people thought that this was confined to deprived working class areas of Dublin. There were a small number of people in the guards and the drug squad, like John McGorty, 
who were totally aware of it, wanted more resources and were not getting more resources. The politicians probably didn't realize the seriousness of the situation. This was a fire that had just started downstairs and they're thinking that somebody will put it out and it will go away. But that, that's not what happened. The habit had to be fed. The Duns had created an army of addicts. In the 1980s, central Dublin was overrun as crime soared. You know, when I take women's handbags or I rob money out of shops, I get people putting cash in a night safe or something in a pouch. I just hit them and take the money off them. What do you hit them with? A pickaxe handle. The biggest factor impacting in the commission of crime was the presence of illegal drugs. Perhaps as much as 50%. Heroin has a massive impact on street crime. Everybody knows that. There have been surveys in the United Kingdom which show that heroin addicts commit crime on something like 360 days a year. Heroin addicts need money. They need a lot of money and they need it every single day. The market the Duns created got so big they couldn't keep up with the supply. The money was so good, other criminals moved in. If you import heroin and you break it down with chalk and so on further than it's already been broken down from pure heroin, you can make 10 times the amount you paid for it. That is, you know, from your point of view, irresistible. And that became the bedrock for a lot of serious crime networks. Unlike the turf wars that dominate the crime scene today, the 80s was an era of peaceful coexistence. Veteran crime figure Tony Filoni swapped prostitution for heroin and quickly gained a lucrative foothold in the smack trade without any kind of retribution from the Duns. Dublin was still physically quite a small place and that helped in a way because if there was a feud, if there was a row between people, they all knew each other and they could all meet. So that was one reason why it was relatively little inter-gang uh, violence. Now the city's a you know, huge, sprawling mass. There's a lot of people out there who don't actually know each other. So it's a much less stable situation now. But in those days, ironically enough, this problem was small enough uh, that people could meet and could uh, you know, talk to each other um, and could sort out most of their problems. They could carve up the city to some extent. Store Street was the busiest police station in the country. Bang at the center of the smack epidemic, deals were being done just a stone's throw away from the station door. All day, every day. It could be bought at the time for about 10,000 pounds per kilo and broken down into approximately 30 ounces. These are similar in size to what would have been sold on the street. These smaller packs here were called cubes and they sold at 40 pounds per pack and out of the pack of 10 the pusher could keep three and sell seven with the result that a kilo of heroin could give a return of 20,000 pounds in 1980 larry dunn was arrested in possession of 60,000 pounds worth of drugs at his home in rotfarno although he was mr big larry dunn had no problems getting bail this gave him the liberty to prosper and thrive. Well, I believe that the deterrent value of criminal sanctions is being lost because of the slowness of the criminal trial process. And what you get is the emergence of a core of hardened, habitual criminals who are free for long periods of time, even after they have been arrested and charged, to plague society. The Larry Duns and the Shamey Duns and the Mickey Duns and others were able to get bail. And while they were on bail, they were able to and did multiply the amount of income that they were able to make from it. Larry discovered that he could organize things on a larger scale and started to ratchet up the amount of income that he could get. At this time, it's estimated Dunn was making £12,000 cash every week. The average industrial worker earned less than £12,000 a year. Larry Dunn was able to put all that money into his bank account and withdraw it whenever he wished, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. 
When the big profit started seeping through from Europe, they couldn't believe just how much money you could make for very little risk. Remember that we had only small investigation units. Customs probably wouldn't have had it as a top priority at the time. The courts were not dealing harshly with our drug offenders, and in that scenario, criminals with profit in mind would have seen that there were opportunities there and they availed of them. As Larry Dunn built his empire, the priority of successive governments lay elsewhere. The security of the state was still the primary concern. Most serious crime was still being committed by the IRA and the INLA. The kidnapping of businessmen like Don Tidy, the abduction of champion horse Shergar, the robberies of banks and payrolls, the murders of an Irish soldier and Gardaí. Traditionally, the IRA weren't active in the South, but during that period they were. And they had shot guards, uh, they had been involved in bank robberies. Their general theory was that they would support the campaign in the North by activity in the South. So the priority, away and beyond anything else, was to combat the threat against the state. We spent about 250 million euros per annum on the Gardaí, border controls. We had a very large presence on the border and the cost of that to the Exchequer was gargantuan. We had to try to control a very serious security situation. That security situation also led to severe overcrowding in Ireland's prisons. There are almost 200 prisoners in Port Leisure at the moment. They include 126 who are in the Provisional IRA group and 21 in the Socialist Republican Alliance who are mainly associated with the INLA. And then, of course, the IRA put enormous pressure on the prison system. So you were faced with decisions for early release of ordinary decent criminals. And, uh, you know, there's no doubt at all that we released people in those days who later on became key members in organized crime. The criminals let loose in the 1980s to make room for IRA volunteers couldn't fail to notice the new world order. Drugs had made the Duns rich. Larry Dunn was making so much from heroin, he ostentatiously bought a mansion in the Dublin mountains. Flash cars, brass suits and fine dining was the preferred lifestyle of the self-made godfather. Yeah, at that stage, Larry Dunn was public enemy number one. The big house symbolized that he was doing well out of other people's misery. He was demonstrating to the people who were still deprived, still unemployed, suffering from heroin in the inner city areas where he had grown up. Larry was now in the big house. When Brendan O'Brien caught up with Lily, Larry's wife at Gorse Rock, she was unrepentant. He's always been a kind, gentle man and a loving father. He's never done us any harm. But the drug he was selling was doing people a lot of harm. Well, I'm only concerned about my family. The drug pushers don't go around beating people to buy it. That's a choice of their own. I wouldn't say Larry went around beating people to buy it off him. While Larry Dunn didn't beat his customers, his smack was killing them. Hundreds of addicts would die from a new plague, AIDS. A lot of them died from AIDS. For many of them, getting HIV was just another part of life. No school, no work, poor housing, into drugs, HIV, AIDS. Pretty pathetic. There would be a day of reckoning for Larry Dunn. In April 1983, over two years after his original arrest, he was finally tried for offences relating to the seizure of drugs at his home in Carrickmount Avenue. Well, I had much to do with the investigation of Larry. He had a very sophisticated operation in the city centre and it took us quite a long time to track him down. The drugs were exhibited and Detective Inspector McGrorty estimated this would fetch between 50 and 60,000 pounds on the street. Surprisingly, despite the overwhelming evidence produced in court, 
the jury failed to reach the unanimous verdict required by law. The jury member who held fast was, as they say, nobbled, got at, intimidated. It was a straight interference with the course of justice. Larry Dunn's retrial began on Tuesday, June the 21st. Dunn himself seemed less at ease than two months previously. Larry was aware by that stage he was going to go down. He was going to be found guilty. During lunchtime, Larry Dunn himself absconded and, of course, he had the supreme luxury of being out on bail and scuttled and left the country. The trial continued in his absence and this time the jury unanimously found him guilty on all counts after only 20 minutes of deliberation. Sentencing was postponed pending his recapture. Where is Larry Dunn now? Rumours abound. Here he is in London's Madame Tussauds with a wax Kojak, cops and robbers. Christopher and Ellen Dunn from Dublin, the parents of the 16 children who've become an underworld legend. How do you feel about the harm they've done, Mrs Dunn? I never knew they were selling drugs, son. I always thought Larry was gambling out of the money that he was left. It's desperate. Desperate. Why do you feel ashamed? You know what I mean? It's really... Dunn's high-profile contempt for the courts forced the coalition government of the day to act and tilt the law against organised crime. I brought in the major criminal justice bill of the 1980s, 1984 Criminal Justice Act, and that provided, a, you know, a new regime for the yards. Under this new regime, juries could return majority verdicts for serious crimes, and the bail laws were tightened up. Measures were also introduced to target drug traffickers. I brought in the Misuse of Drugs Act, which for the first time imposed a very hard uh, sentence for the possession and distribution of drugs. The courts were a bit iffy about the idea, but we brought it in and we passed it through the doll and, and it was implemented. In March 1985, Larry Dunn finally ran out of road. He was captured in Portugal and sent back to face the music in Dublin, where he got 14 years in prison. Mr Justice McMahon said Dunn had supplied a large part of the drugs used by the young people of Dublin. He was a controlling force in a major drug importing activity. The crowd shouted abuse and threw eggs, and at one stage the gate of the courthouse was slammed against the guard of van, causing minor damage. As he was being led away, Dunn made an infamous prophecy. If you think we're bad, wait till you see what's coming after us. By the mid-1980s, Ireland's first wave of drug barons had been put away. Larry Dunn and eight members of his family were inside. Eight have been convicted for crimes related to heroin. Michael Dunn, known as Mickey Dazzler, was caught with heroin in his flat and got seven years. His wife, Dolores, now trying to break her heroin habit, got a two-year suspended sentence. Well, it's certainly true to say that the Dunns were pivotal. They weren't as big as the people who came after them some way down the line, but they certainly organized networks. So they set up trails which others could use and tap into. Part of their downfall was that while they were pivotal, they were never able to get big enough to distance themselves completely from their operations. So that when, when Larry was finally caught, he was caught with heroin and other drugs in his own house. This would not have happened to some of the big guys further down the line. The scene was about to change, and so was the cast. The fact that we have taken out a lot of the bigger fish uh, has meant that a lot of small criminals are now thinking big. In the aftermath of the breaking up of the Dunn family of drug dealers, what then took place was a fragmentation on the crime scene in Dublin. We had a multiplicity of gangs, perhaps as many as 40 different gangs located all over the city who saw this as an opportunity for them to get involved in the drug trade. And they did that. The men who would rise to the top, the likes of George Mitchell, John Cunningham, and John Gilligan, had all ran and robbed with the Duns. 
In the late 80s, while in prison, they had time to study the rise and fall of Larry Dunn and his brothers and learn from their mistakes. Gangs normally come from blood relationships, from localised areas in the neighbourhood that they come from, or sometimes they've served time in prison. Bonds of friendship are forged there. They assure each other they will hatch a wonderful plan to go and do highly profitable crime, and next time they won't get caught. Behind bars in Port Leisha, the next big player would turn out to be John Gilligan. Please, John. <laughs> Factory John from Ballyfermot, a small time crook who had specialised in warehouse jobs. On the landings and in the exercise yard, he would put together the nucleus of a new gang with a game plan to fill the void and get rich quick. Essentially, John Gilligan and his main lieutenant serve sentences in Port Leash Prison together. Now, these lieutenants turned out to be quite loyal to John Gilligan. Uh, unlike some of the, the, the gangs which followed, loyalty was not a big issue. But in the Gilligan gang, these individuals, there was about six of them, and they were very, very loyal. Oh, referee. Yellow card. Send him off. Gilligan's Praetorian Guard would include Brian Meehan, Peter Mitchell, and Paul Ward. John Gilligan, when he came out of prison, identified a niche in the market. He decided that cannabis resin would be his business. He decided that for a number of reasons. One was that he felt that by operating in the area of cannabis resin, that he wouldn't be as big a target for law enforcement as if he was dealing in heroin. He also saw that there were more people in this country using cannabis resin, and the people who were using cannabis resin had more money to spend on that drug. It was the beginnings of the Celtic Tiger era. The Gilligan gang brought drug trafficking in this country to another level. They brought a business-like structure to their empire. They dealt directly with associates in the continent. They bought in bulk. They had a sophisticated logistic and distribution network. One of the first things that we noticed was the extent of the operation and the size of the pyramid which John Gilligan, as headman, had created. Between May of 1994 and October of uh, 1996, the street value of cannabis which they brought in was in excess of £200 million at that time. There are phenomenal profits to be made in drug importation and marketing, as we know, and what Larry Dunn was making was nothing at all in comparison to what uh, John Gilligan was making at that point. The outward signs of that wealth was the house in Jesbrook and the trappings that were there, the equestrian centre, and how he was able to develop that and, and buy and, and pay for that and put all the best equipment and furniture into it. I think that's indicative of how wealthy he was. The profits were so excessive that sometimes we had difficulty in reporting the amounts for the simple reason that those above us in authority would have seen us as building empires, exaggerating the problem in order to get more resources. Some of it, frankly, once you got into the millions, was quite unbelievable. I would have to say that on my desk in the Department of Justice, did organized crime feature largely? No, it didn't. What featured largely during all of that time and all the high files that I had were, you know, the Provost, the INLA, the UVF, and the focus of the government and the focus of the commissioner and the focus of the Department of Justice was all on paramilitary violence because we were going through terrible times during that period. To come out and say that a two-bit Dublin criminal from one of the poor areas of the city was now dealing in millions in Holland and was back and forth and had an army of drug dealers was quite unbelievable. And they would take convincing, and did take convincing, uh, at, at a certain point. None of us realised at the time, certainly I didn't realise, the extent to which 
this kind of crime was going to grow and how the bubble was going to burst and how everything that has happened since in the whole organised crime area was going to develop. The extent of the crime uh, in Dublin City particularly is just alarming and the inability of the guards because of the legislation to really do anything about it or to properly address it is something that has to be publicised. Now when we do it we're effectively bringing pressure onto the criminals and either by guards or by legislation and they just don't like it. I'm not the only crime reporter that, sure. you know, does this. And I think that the regrettable thing is that we're all probably targets, unfortunately. In 1995, when Veronica Gearn attempted to question John Gilligan about his vast wealth, he beat her up. She later pressed assault charges, and in June 1996, Gardy believed John Gilligan had her assassinated to prevent her testifying against him in court. It's in the aftermath of something horrendous having taken place that you will be listened to. Uh, until that has happened, you're not likely to be taken too seriously because there are so many other issues and problems vying for attention and for scarce resources. Everything changed after Veronica Gearn politicians for the first time realized that this is a very serious problem. Nobody is untouchable and the government is absolutely determined that whoever ordered this murder will sooner or later and I hope sooner face charges in our courts. When that happened uh, the whole system was shocked from top to bottom and you had one of those uh, plateau points when there was a consensus from the Supreme Court across to the guards and back into the doll and across into the media that you know whatever had to be done would be done and that everybody would uphold everybody else's decision there was a realization this is a step too far now the focus of attention is going to be on organized crime and they are going to regret the day that this happened For the first time, the apparatus of the state was now fully focused on organised crime. The Criminal Assets Bureau was set up to go after the ill-gotten gains of Ireland's leading criminals. John Gilligan and his mob was the first target. At the same time, the team investigating the murder of Veronica Gearn was probing the gang and seeking to exploit any weak links in the pyramid. In 1996, uh, I was seconded to the Veronica Gear investigation as a detective inspector, sort of in, in charge of the incident room out there. It took actually 400 arrests to get the full degree of information from this pyramid. We never really came to terms with the individuals who were in Port Leash prison with him. They did not talk, they remained loyal right to the end. But because of the size of the operation, he also recruited people who were not actually hardcore criminals. You're talking about Charlie Bowden, who was basically an army man. You're talking about Russell Warren, who had some minor uh, criminal convictions. And you're talking about a store man in, in Cork, John Dunn. When they came into custody, uh, they had remorse, which none of the other guys had. And through this, then, we were able to obtain details of the entire organization. And this was the dismantling of the organization from within. Combined international police pressure on John Gilligan's organization finally paid off. On October the 6th, 1996, he was arrested in Heathrow Airport with a case containing over £300,000 in cash. Gilligan fought his extradition to Ireland for nearly three and a half years before he exhausted every legal loophole. Two detectives from Lucan, Thomas O'Loughlin and Michael Murray, escorted the 47-year-old Dublin man back to Ireland. On February the 3rd, 2000, John Gilligan arrived at Baldonnell to finally face Irish justice. He was eventually given 20 years for drug trafficking offences and had all his trophy possessions seized. His chief lieutenant, Brian Meehan, is serving life for the murder of Veronica Gearn and lost his assets. The rest of the gang were either jailed or went on the run. In total, 
over 10 million euro was confiscated from them. The toppling of the Gilligan network created yet another vacuum in Irish organized crime. The major players scurried abroad with as much loot as they could carry to regroup and rebuild. Post the decline or demise of the Gilligan gang, you had almost a flight of other experienced drug traffickers to Europe. That was where they could prosper. That was where they had their contacts, where they needed to be in terms of organizing distribution, logistics, finance, etc. A number of the really experienced criminals in the Dublin area, I'm talking about Georgie Mitchell, I'm talking about Christy Kinahan, and I'm talking about John Cunningham. They made a conscious decision to take up position abroad in Holland, in Amsterdam, in Spain, different places, and just act as facilitators. They were still taking their cut from the importation of drugs, but they had a much better chance of securing their funding abroad and keeping it abroad. They were all quite afraid of the, the Criminal Assets Bureau and its powers to uh, seize their assets. It left here in Ireland somewhat of a vacuum, and into that vacuum came other smaller groups keen to make a name for themselves, but ruthless in their approach. These guys, typified maybe by a gang locally known as the Westies, uh, came to the forefront during this period. Stephen Sugg and Shane Coates, the notorious leaders of the Westies, were a sign of things to come. Young and extremely violent, they murderously seized their share of the drug market in the late 90s and maintained it through a reign of fear. Basically, they were joyriders and tearaways and small-time criminals prior to the Gilligan demise, but they saw the opportunity of uh, filling a vacuum and uh, creating an empire for themselves in, in West Dublin. Many of the people who are up to their necks in drugs and organized crime, actually, they have no other skills. If you look at them, there's nothing else in life that they are fitted for and they find it very easy to get involved in the drugs culture, making quick money as they see it. They were in-your-face type criminals who had scant regard for law and order and perpetrated misery throughout the community, perpetrated violence on those communities. Absolutely, no doubt in my mind, that they wanted to sort of enslave the community out there. They identified that we had taken down the Gilligan group from within, and they were ensuring by acts of grotesque violence that this was not going to happen. The Westies were the nightmare Larry Dunn had prophesied. Grotesque exhibitions of violence was their signature modus operandi. Neither friend nor foe was safe from their paranoia. I recall instance where they had used jump leads to uh, electrocute people. They used torture of different methods. They used vice grips on people's fingers. They used baseball bats to beat them. One guy uh, was beaten by an iron bar first, and then he was held down and his face was sliced up. It took 60 stitches to put him back together again. During their brief heyday, Sugg and Coates grossed £100,000 a week from their drug dealing. But their terror tactics attracted intense pressure from the police. In May 2003, the Westies were retrieving a stash of 20 stolen firearms from a vacant house in County Cavan when they were confronted by Gardaí. An exchange of gunfire left Shane Coates wounded, but they managed to evade capture and fled to Spain. Eventually, they decided to follow the uh, suit of some of the other experienced criminals who went abroad. And that, for them, was a fatal mistake because they tried to apply the same tactics over there as they had been applying in Blanchardstown. This led to their death. The two bodies, found buried six feet under concrete in an industrial estate in Catral in Spain, were exhumed today. But it will take some time before forensics and DNA can confirm the identities. Carthy, however, believe the bodies are those of Stephen Sugg and Shane Coates. The Westies had planned to establish a cocaine and heroin trafficking network, but the south of Spain proved to be treacherous turf. Their bodies were found in 2006, two years after they were liquidated by rival Irish criminals in Alicante. The 
boom years were good years for organized crime. A salary soared, lifestyles changed, and bad habits were acquired. If smack was synonymous with the era of doom and gloom in the 80s, cocaine was the poison of choice for the good time revelers of the noughties. As the economy boomed, the rewards to be gained from organized crime were too good to be true. Young men with nothing to lose would emerge from the shadows, armed to the teeth, seeking to carve out their slice of the drug trade. This was no country for old men. I would describe the modern day criminal as unpredictable, paranoid, totally protective of his turf, and he will go to any length to protect his business. Unlike even the Mafia, they have no sense of family or loyalty. Every gang leader that I ever saw would dump his top lieutenant if it suited his purpose. The reality of it is, none of these gangs last longer than three to four years. Uh, PJ Judge, he was running his own organization back in the early 90s. He was murdered. In turn, Marla Highland. Uh, he took over from uh, PJ Judge. And in turn, of course, Marla Highland was murdered as well. And in turn, again, Eamon Dunn took over from Marlow. Eamon Dunn is now dead as well. These pyramids are effectively a uh, pyramid of death. Guns were a very rare thing. All of a sudden, they blossomed. Everybody had a gun. It was like that old thing. You're any country with a gun, you go out and get a bigger gun. You get a bigger gun, you get a tank. And I honestly believe that's exactly what happened. And that plays fair. Their problem is to stay alive themselves. And as soon as they perceive somebody as being a threat to their operation, well then something very definite and permanent is going to be done about it. Because the Criminal Assets Bureau has targeted the money uh, so effectively. Money now is being stashed in attics, is being stashed in woods and being stashed in different places. Inevitably money goes missing. This is a death sentence to whoever has control of that money. Therein lies your problem with many of these murders. The drug bargains, they're not going to do the shooting themselves. No top man does the shootings. So what he does is he sends it down to his young links. And this is what's happening in us. All these young men are senselessly murdering each other. And for what? What was happening was, there was a generation coming up behind who knew nothing, only that, and knew that there were phenomenal amounts of money to be made by drug dealing. And even through the Celtic Tiger years, when there was so-called full employment, there were kids that uh, weren't interested in that, like, there was uh, easier ways of making money. So far, the 21st century in Ireland has been an era of bloodshed. Nearly 200 gangland murders have been committed in the Republic since the year 2000. Most of them remain unsolved. At the top of the food chain, above the vicious bloodletting, are the big fish who have survived hostile waters. Veterans like Christy Kenahan. Until his arrest in Spain in April 2010, Kenahan, operating below the radar, was the main supplier to Ireland's one billion euro plus drugs trade. Most of the upper echelons of, of organized crime groups operate on a very sophisticated basis in an almost business-like fashion. They tend to be remote to the actual events that occur on the street. They do not seek to get their hands dirty, deal drugs or collect cash. They even employ professionals to advise them in a business capacity. Christy Kinnahan's assets were uh, in a range of countries from Belgium, Ireland, uh, England, Spain. Uh, his own house in Spain was worth six million. He has assets alone in Brazil of 500 million, which is more than the Criminal Assets Bureau have taken in their entire history in Ireland in the last 15 years. When Kenahan was busted, his close pal and longtime business partner John Cunningham was also picked up. 
The life stories of these two veteran gangsters mirrors that of organized crime in Ireland. From small scale robberies to the big league of international drug trafficking, gun running and money laundering. Organized crime has come a long way since the Duns first flooded Dublin with heroin. Today, in the Liberties area of Dublin, a group of young men are learning about how heroin changed Ireland in the 1980s. Joey peered out of the archway again. Down the street, a middle-aged woman was crossing over towards the credit union office. Joey punched her hard in the face. She toppled over and fell face downwards, hitting the ground heavily and losing consciousness. Fran ran to the fallen woman and tried to pull the bag from her shoulder. Fucking old cunt he raised as he kicked at her to turn her over. Forget it, Fran Joey urged. Fran jumped up cursing and swearing as both he and Joey ran off into the night. Walking down around that area, what's missing most in it are the people who should be there. Those who passed away before their time. Many of them I knew very well. Many of them I had interaction with and had arrested charged and many of them went to prison for different offenses a lot of which were caused to feed a heroin habit and there continues to be so much grief and sadness associated with this drug business we allowed an industry to build up in this country which was illegal which sold drugs to people who were very vulnerable in very broken communities, which proved a breeding ground for crime. And we're now living with the consequences because we're now into, what, probably the second generation or third generation of youngsters who don't know any other life. Our prisons are full of drug convicts. As soon as one is let out, another is put in. Seizures are record year upon year. There are queues of people being convicted before the courts and locked up, and yet, Nobody can say that that is defeating the drug problem. Why? Because the market still exists. Right, we'll wrap it up. Right. The last chapter's next week. See you next week. My daughter, for the eight years she was an addict, there were peaks and troughs. We just wanted things solved. In my daughter's case, it was a baby. Pregnancy. Turning her life around. It's over. But uh, other families haven't been so lucky.